This is a limited series of the Rational Reminder podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision making focused on cryptocurrencies. We are hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, portfolio managers at PWL Capital. Welcome to episode 15 of this series. And this week, we have a very clear, thoughtful, great speaker uh, in Vili Ledenverda. Incredible. I, I learned so much from this and he helped assemble so many of the pieces I think that, that I've been kind of struggling with. And uh, Vili is a professor of economic sociology and digital social research at the Oxford Internet Institute at University of Oxford. But Ben, you want to kind of kick off this intro with a, a story. Yeah, and I mean, the story's not, not too crazy, but uh, we, I, I, I found a paper um, by Philly and a co-author uh, named Jilly Vidan, and it was a great paper. It's called Mind the Gap, Bitcoin and the Maintenance of Trustlessness. It's fascinating. Uh, it's basically about the human interventions that have allowed Bitcoin to uh, persist like the human interventions that have happened behind the scenes and, and, and how that have been, those have been necessary for Bitcoin to persist. And uh, then they talk about the discursive strategies that were used in communicating what had happened uh, in a way that didn't take away the trustless perception of Bitcoin. It's just a fascinating paper, fascinating concept. So I read that and then I, as we tend to do, got in touch with uh with Billy because I thought he might be an interesting podcast guest. And the timing ended up being kind of kind of nice because he had a book that was uh, un- unpublished at the time, but he had a book coming out on uh, on on platform technologies and how they've affected society. And he talks about cryptocurrencies in the book. So anyway, I got in touch with him and said, listen, I read your paper, loved having a podcast. And he was like, oh, well, here's an advanced copy of my book. Maybe we can talk about that too. I was like, per- perfect, good timing. Uh, so the book is Cloud Empires, How Digital Platforms Are Overtaking the State and How We Can Regain Control from uh, MIT Press. It, it is published, I think, in, in September is when it's supposed to be coming out. Yep. Uh, it's it's an f- uh, excellent, excellent book. Um, but I think, like you said, Cameron, it it, it connects so many of the dots that were previously left unconnected in my in my mind just in terms of how to think about cryptocurrency and and blockchain um i think the 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 cleanest example of that of that of the connecting the dots is that Vili talks about how cryptocurrencies and and the the design that uh, satoshi nakamoto uh, had for them solves administration of rules but it does not solve the making of rules. And you can't have a functioning economic system without the ability to do both of those things. And because in the case of cryptocurrencies, there is just no system for how the rules are are made and changed other than maybe informal uh, agreements and things like that, you end up with what Vili calls a cryptocracy where power centralizes in places that you can't necessarily see or identify. Uh, So the rules end up being made by some some party with limited or no accountability to the users of the network to the people who are involved uh anyway so i i think that's pretty i, I think that's pretty profound um we talked about how the world is changing so much that to have rules like this that aren't as flexible as might be needed in an ever changing world and i thought his discussion around you know we have global challenges that are very hard to solve with state networks which I thought that was interesting. Climate change, it's a good one, right? Very, yeah. very interesting. And you, and you can't have static rules. That's one of the other things that he talked about. Like for, for in, in the example of Bitcoin, uh, for there to be rules that never change, you're implicitly making an assumption that the world is never going to change. Uh, for, the, for the desired outcome based on the original design of, of Bitcoin in the example, uh, you may no longer get that desired outcome when the world around you changes, which requires governance. It requires changes to the rules of the network, but it's not clear who gets to make those rules and who gets to uh, even in, in enforce the, the the rules in some cases. Um, 
Yeah, so it's just this interesting situation in cryptocurrencies where it's not clear who has control and who ultimately has the most influence. Um, but there are a lot of people economically who are being affected by these systems, which it makes it, a, I think, a pretty important thing to talk about. I agree. He also published the book Virtual Economies Design and Analysis, and he's authored and co-authored over 30 peer review articles published in journals such as Socioeconomic Review, Sociology, and Journal of Management. Yep, I think that's a good enough introduction. Uh, it, it can't possibly be better than the conversation that we just had with Vili. So we'll sure. we'll go ahead, we'll go ahead to the conversation. All right, here's our conversation with Vili Leiden Verda. Vili Leiden Verda, welcome to the Rational Reminder Podcast. Thank you very much, Ben. Glad to be here. Awesome. Uh, so, Vili, to start off, what was John Perry Barlow's vision for cyberspace? Sure. So John Perry Barlow in the 90s, um, he was, you know, the Cold War was just ending and humanity almost got destroyed uh, by nuclear weapons. So John Perry Barlow was one of many people who thought that humanity really ought to be able to do better and come up with a form of essentially social organization that, that doesn't rely on states to protect us because states, besides protecting us, they can also destroy us. And he went looking for that sort of social order on the Internet. And he thought that there could be an Internet society, a cyber society that was based not on, on, on state authority and laws and bureaucracy, but on, on reciprocity and reputation, on individual responsibility as the means to achieve social order. Hmm. And why wasn't his vision realized? Well, it sort of maybe it was for a while. So in the 1980s, for instance, I studied these uh, 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 early uh, online marketplaces, the Usenet marketplace, and there basically contracts were enforced by people just sort of relying on each other to do the right thing, just like in a, in a sort of rural uh, village. If you, if you uh, uh, if, if you don't honor your promises, then you get ostracized out of the community. And this is how it worked in these early online, uh, these electronic communities. But then as the Internet began to grow in the 1990s, we had the sort of boom of, of, of commercial Internet service providers. And suddenly millions of people pouring into these communities and they grew from being just communities into sort of boom towns and eventually mega cities and the sort of village style Rep reciprocity and, 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 you know, being kind to your neighbors just wasn't enough anymore, anymore to maintain social order. And basically things fell apart. The Usenet marketplace was taken over by scammers and, 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 and hmm. spammers. And this happened many times over. Hmm. Maybe to abstract from that, what role do states play in markets? So ultimately states are... Uh, states underpin markets by enforcing contracts and property rights. So most of the time, we don't need to appeal to the state to enforce a contract. People just sort of honor their promises. And, and most of the time, it'd be too expensive anyway in terms of the transaction costs to go to court over every possible little deal. Right. But ultimately, states are what underpin social order in the sort of modern society. And so Bala was hoping that this could be, and other sort of cyber libertarians were hoping that on the internet we could forego states and state authority as the under uh, sort of um, uh, underpinners of economic uh, activity and instead sort of move into this more personal responsibility based system and that way also avoid the, the problem of states and other sort of for formal institutions, which is that they can also abuse that authority. Mm. How do markets tend to function at scale in the absence of a state? Well, they don't. <laughs> That's the problem. So if you look at essentially economic history, the growth of these large scale impersonal markets that characterize modern society is also the story of the growth of the state and its ability to, to use laws and, and, and bureaucracy and regulations and different mm -hmm. kinds of institutions to, to provide those underpinnings. I mean, we see, you know, for instance, in, in, in medieval times, there are examples of long distance trade uh, conducted by, by medieval merchants and that is underpinned 
to uh, to a large extent by personal reputation, by networks of merchants knowing each other. But ultimately, uh, those never could grow very big because you know once it grows too large then the information costs start getting higher uh, bigger and 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 it just Mm. doesn't work anymore order falls apart interesting i I remember reading uh david graber's book and one of the things that struck me in there was i I think he he mentions that states or or at least uh governance may precede markets Do, do you have a view on that so certainly uh, hierarchical order and empires, you know, Sumerian empires, they, uh, they precede markets, uh, hmm. for sure. Um, but markets as a form of economic organization were really kind of niche, kind of si- in the sidelines for most of human history. In most of human history, economic organization was based on hierarchy and sort of uh, uh, customary uh, uh, obligations and, 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 and rights. And uh, even in medieval times, markets were really a sort of sideshow for rulers to get their hands on some, or wealthy people to get their hands on some exotic uh, items. Mm-hmm. And only towards modernity, in, in this sort of early modernity, do we start seeing the kind of emergence of large-scale markets for uh, for corn and that sort of stuff. Interesting. What 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 role are, are the massive platform companies playing in today's economy? So today. Uh, my argument is that, in, in basically, that's the, the one of the main arguments of my book, Cloud Empires, is that digital platforms have now uh, assumed the role of, that state used to have in terms of underpinning uh, economic activity hmm. in digital markets, especially markets that are transnational in nature, because the state is a territorial form of social organization by definition. Uh, has a lot of trouble underpinning exchange that that uh, crosses boundaries. There's a, as yeah. you know, there's a there's a big cost uh, to 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 cross border trade, and so what platforms are able to do uh, is that they're able to create these environments, these institutional environments on the internet where you're trading uh, under a single set of rules um, with people from different countries. Whether it's you know it's a it's an online labor market like Upwork or a, an e-commerce uh, market like Amazon Marketplace or or anything else. Interesting. How are states and platform companies different? Well, the crucial difference is that te- uh, state jurisdiction is territorial. So states, there's other sort of in international law also other forms of, of, of justifications for, for states to extend their jurisdiction. But the main idea is that states exercise jurisdiction within their territories and about 100 kilometers up, depending mm-hmm. on which state you ask. Um, whereas platforms of jurisdiction, quote unquote, is based on membership. It's, it's personal uh, jurisdiction. People can be anywhere in the world if they choose to subject themselves to jurisdiction of a particular platform empire hmm. what why do you think from, from this perspective of, of economic organization why do you think public blockchain technology has garnered so much attention right so the kind of, I've been following uh, blockchain for a long time I mean I started uh, following Bitcoin in, in, in 2010 when I met one of the original developers and hmm. uh, and the the whole idea why uh, blockchain technologies and, and cryptocurrencies attracted so much attention and the imaginations of so many people, I think, is because they they promised to fundamentally change this uh, tenet of economic organization that I've outlined, which is that for large scale markets, for a large scale economic activity, you really need to have this authority to underpin uh, uh, the, the, the activity, to enforce the contracts, to, to protect the property rights. And blockchain proponents basically say we can replace that authority with this network with this distributed network uh, that is going to cryptographically or crypto economically uh, guarantee the execution of contracts or the the protection of property rights and why this is revolutionary as a claim is (coughs) excuse me is because um that means you would get the benefits of formal institutions the benefits of that authority which is underpinning that activity, but without the downside of the potential for abuse. So you would solve the sort of 
millennia old problem of political science, which is that authorities mm. protect us, but who will protect us from the authorities? So here, here you have a form of order that's sort of guaranteed not to overstep its its boundaries. Hmm. So interesting. Can, can you talk about how John Perry Barlow's vision that we talked about earlier influenced cryptocurrencies? So um, Barlow was sort of uh, belonged to um, a movement that has at least later been characterized as uh, cyber libertarianism. And the idea being that let's use technology to create a libertarian social order where we don't need to rely on the state or any other form of authority. And cryptocurrencies sort of emerge from this related movement or, or sort of school of thought, which is variously known as, as um, crypto anarchism or cypherpunks. And they are, in some ways, they're like a flavor of cyber libertarianism uh, and in the sense that they're also trying to create um, a social order that without state or, or, or large corporate authorities. Um, but they're trying to do that specifically with uh, cryptographic technology. Hmm. What is a clerotarian and what role did it play in Athenian democracy? Okay, so in cloud empires, I love to do this thing where I basically I pick something from the ancient, ancient or medieval world and show that it's essentially a precursor to something that's now happening in the internet economy. Basically to show that after all, there's very little that's new under the sun, right? And Clarotarion is really one of my favorite examples because it's an ancient machine for decentralizing gov government power, right? And it's, in, in practical terms, it's, it's a big rectangular slab of stone. It's about the height of a man. And onto the face of that stone, you have carved uh, this fine matrix of slots, hundreds of slots arranged into to rows and columns. And into each of the slots, every morning, uh, citizens, of, so this is happening in, in ancient Athens, you know, around 3000, 4, uh, 300, 400 BC. Around the Claritarian, each morning, uh, citizens gather and they put tokens, each person has a token, possibly made of brass, uh, representing them. They stick it into one of the slots in the machine. And then when things click into action, there's a sort of mechanism that starts releasing uh, black and, and white balls uh, made of ivory um, uh, uh, randomly and uh, if a white ball uh, hits or basically lands next to your token uh, that means you are congratulations you're now a government official for the day and if a black ball lands on your token then uh, sorry uh, you're out for today and this way, basically, ancient Athenians, they randomly distributed uh, government positions. Certain roles were, were reallocated every 24 hours and some other roles uh, on a slightly longer cycle. And the analogy, of course, here uh, is, is to blockchain and, and specifically to the proof of work uh, algorithm, which uh, in a very similar way, the idea is uh, let's let's choose randomly who is uh, the administrator responsible for right. verifying the, the last 10 minutes worth of transactions and, 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 and compiling them into a, a block, a record that can then be appended into the official uh, record. So it's a, there's, a, there's a very uh, a strong analogy there, I think. Right. So in both cases, we're kind of putting our trust in the algorithm as opposed to in people. That's right, because the idea is when when you distribute the power so thinly across the population, nobody gains really enough power to really abuse it. Um, but together, the algorithm kind of ensures that things um, sort of hold together and you still have that capable administration and those property rights are protected. But no individual official has enough power in their hands um, to actually abuse that position. <laughs> On, on that thought, continuing that thought, what does it mean to trust in code? 
So, Satoshi Nakamoto, who, who was uh, the pseudonymous uh, creator of, of Bitcoin, he uh, talked a lot about how the problem with conventional money and conventional uh, financial systems was the fact that you needed to trust uh, a lot of people. So, you know, uh, you need to trust the central bank not to debase the currency. You need to trust uh, 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 payment platforms like PayPal to actually um, uh, carry out your transaction. Yep. And, um, you know, there, there were around the time he was writing 2008, 2009, there were uh, good examples why you shouldn't necessarily trust these parties always. We, the, the world was just reeling from the financial crisis. There were a lot of people thinking, okay, the financial system, the people in the financial system, they're not really uh, trustworthy. They're not worth our trust. They've actually abused that trust because they've, they've sold us uh, products they knew um, were not um, backed by sufficient collateral. And then, and, and, you know, they've, they've pulled all these nasty moves. PayPal was infamous for freezing on occasion uh, merchants' accounts and then giving them no uh, recourse, essentially. And and so Nakamoto was arguing that the problem in all of this is we have to trust uh, uh, these people. And that's analogous to what I said before is basically the ancient problem of political science. Authorities protect us, but who will protect us from the authorities? So the financial system and PayPal, uh, they, they protect our money, but who will protect our money from them? And so trust in code was the idea that, well, what if we replace these human authorities with a system in which the protection is instead essentially uh, carried out by an incorruptible algorithm, uh, a sort of uh, a piece of code, um, which which it, which only which doesn't afford any human actor enough power to actually abuse that power. So instead of having to trust uh, humans, we're now trusting code. Hmm. What new properties did smart contracts create? So smart contracts uh, are uh, contracts that are executed by uh, program code uh, instead of being executed by, by lawyers or, or uh, bureaucracies or court or something like that. That in itself is not super uh, revolutionary because we have a program code executing contracts. Uh, we've had that for a long time. Like if you order something from Amazon, and it's it's delivered later um it's not like there's some human administrator there looking at your you know your order and going like oh now we should really ship this to Vili now because now the, the books came into your warehouse now there is an algorithm that checks oh the uh the books in our warehouse great now dispatch it to Vili. and so and and the same in in uh payroll uh corporate payroll right every month there is an algorithm that sends out payments uh, very few cases is that done by hand so that in itself is not particularly revolutionary. What is claimed to be revolutionary is how uh, smart contract systems based on blockchain technology like Ethereum, uh, in, in those the execution of the code is, uh, uh, of the smart contract is not done by code running on the server administered by um, a, a company which could choose to unilaterally change that code so that it no longer does what it was supposed to do. Instead, it's executed by a, a blockchain network, which mm -hmm. uh, works according to these same principles, whether it's, uh, you know, usually it's proof of, for now, it's usually it's, it's a proof of work um, algorithm that ensures that uh, basically the smart contract gets executed exactly as written and and nothing else and you don't have to take the system administrator's word for that it's sort of you sort of have cryptographic or at least crypto economic guarantees that this will actually be the case so again the idea is that this eliminates the need to trust humans this solves the ancient problem of political science we get the benefits of authority benefits of of somebody really enforcing our contracts and property rights but without the risk of abuse mm. What do you think are the social and economic implications of unstoppable uh, censorship-resistant contracts? Well, you know, if that was possible, it would be pretty crazy because we've had, we've, the, 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 for ec in economic history, we've had essentially the entire 
uh, history of human economies is is uh, state authority or sort of hierarchical authority makes large scale markets possible. Um, but then it also means that now these authorities have a lot of power. Uh, so it's a sort of um, it's a sort of uh, you, you know you get you win some you lose some, and then suddenly you have this promise of a sort of asymmetrical promise that now we can organize these economies and markets uh, on a massive scale, but we don't need to trust anyone uh, to do that. So that could have massive implications. Now it would enable the creation of of markets outside uh, of human control, outside political control, and that would have all kinds of ramifications, good and bad, I think, to the extent that we think that the government intervention is sometimes uh, very uh, important and necessary, even for reasons of equity or redistribution, for instance, then this sort of a uh, um, crypto economy would, um, if it, it took off, it would exclude that possibility. And so and it would be a, sort of a fulfillment of the cyber libertarian and, and crypto anarchist uh, dream of uh, social order based really just on the individual responsibility and without any form of uh, state or other authority. In practice, how impactful have smart contracts been? So uh, initially, uh, uh, the you know Ethereum smart contracts were, you know, they, the, most of the applications were just sort of different forms of gambling and um, uh, whether whether explicit gambling or or. Uh, in, implicit something that is sold as a as a real investment scheme, but in the end turns out to be a Ponzi scheme or something like that. So the the actual applications were not particularly impressive. But then you started getting some some people um, thinking, okay, how can you use this for something uh, more productive? And one of the most exciting project was called the DAO, the Distributed Autonomous Organization, right? Mm -hmm. And it was essentially um, like an investor managed uh, um, uh, a fund, an investment fund. So a um, bunch of people uh, pull their money in and then they vote on what they want to invest that money in on. And then uh, any, 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 any profits they get to take out, they can, they can vote to then uh, take out of the system, except that it wasn't registered um, as a corporate entity under the laws of any state anywhere, it was all based on uh, smart contracts running on the Ethereum platform. All the the sort of the corporate governance, uh, the, the, uh, the investing into it, uh, paying out the proceeds, all of that was based on smart contracts. Running the voting procedure was uh, based on smart contracts. So. Um, very impressive idea of like let's create this free floating investment fund that's not dependent on the laws of any state hmm. it was a cool idea and i think they raised a ton uh, a ton more capital than they even expected to that's uh, right about a hundred and if i remember correctly about 150 million dollars worth of ethereum and it was a huge chunk of all the ethereum in circulation at the time wow. yeah it's a crazy story oh, sorry of ether of ether <laughs> ethereum is a virtual currency in, in the end how were the uh, trustless and unstoppable claims of of cryptocurrencies and DAOs uh, affected by by the DAO story right so what happened with the DAO right uh, was somebody figured out that there was a bug in the code and this is it despite the fact that it was audited you know they did it they, 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 they they audited the code and, and, you know, it was open source and so on. But somebody figured out there's a bug. And they used that bug to start siphoning money out of the, the fund, right? And they managed to get away with, with uh, around a third of the, the money invested into the fund. And then when people got very upset about this and they, you know, they started calling for something to be done like there's been attack there's been a hack we've been hacked and we've been uh we've been robbed the there an, an anonymous message appeared uh claiming to be from the attacker quote unquote which said well i'm very disappointed that you would characterize this as an attack because actually i was just following the rules of the smart contract 
you had written <laughs> into that smart contract the possibility for me to withdraw a third of your funds. And, you know, the fact that it's it's there in the contract uh, means that it's legit. And that's what you intended, wasn't it? Because they even had the 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 founders of this, the DAO, they stated on their website, they had like a human readable version of the rules of this fund, right? But the, the, it said that, well, this is just for for illustration that the 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 in, in case there is any conflict between what's set here in the human readable version and the actual code, the smart contract, the smart contract prevails. That's the ultimate uh, authoritative expression of uh, the rules of a fund. So the so-called attacker was was in fact uh, from the point of view of the smart contracts and from the point of view of the Ethereum smart contracts platform. Uh, just following the rules of the system and making use of an ability of a feature that was built into the system. And if somebody thinks it's a bug, that's just in the eyes of the beholder. Uh, there's no objective way of saying that's a that's a bug rather than a feature. Um, but so what happened was um, <laughs> the the this this argument did not win the day, right? Um, so long story short. Uh, Vitalik Buterin, the, the, the sort of uh, a, a, a child genius founder of um, or co-founder of Ethereum, he sort of stepped in and uh, he basically used his authority to, I'm, I'm cutting a lot of corners here, but used his kind of authority and, and, and uh, 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 trust that he had to basically say, okay, we're going to roll, roll back the system a bit. And they essentially rolled back things. Uh, they, they 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 changed the code in such a way that um, the attacker was uh, dispossessed. It was uh, they were uh, their funds were con confiscated, and the funds were returned uh, to the original owners. And uh, this was very very controversial and caused a big fuss because suddenly. It showed that no, it was it was this was not unstoppable incorruptible code because the web Ethereum's website said this is unstoppable uh, incorruptible uh, code that you know the no possibility of downtime, no possibility of any any humans intervening in this process. This is all algorithmic and you know trust the code, not the people, and so on. And then suddenly, when things go wrong. Then some, you know, a person steps in and says, "Actually, you know, trust the um, people." Yeah, yeah, right. So it was very controversial because it showed all of that rhetoric to be a sham. Um, but they had to do it because basically the whole platform uh, would have been in trouble because so much of of uh, ether, the the the, the uh, currency unit circulating in the platform, was tied up into that one single project. Uh, at the time, so they then subsequently <laughs> they removed the words uh, "unstoppable code" from the, from the website, um, and they started focusing more on the idea of um, sort of smart smart contract platform uh, that is kind of managed uh, responsibly. Wow! Uh, did the, the the Bitcoin block size conflict of I think 2015 to 2017 did that have a similar effect on crypto's perception of trustlessness so uh for some people yeah so C bitcoin has had uh multiple moments like this to that in my opinion demonstrate that it's likewise ultimately still underpinned by human trust and and, and we haven't kind of solved that uh, ancient political problem in any way for instance in 2018 <coughs> a bug was discovered in bitcoin core the core code that was so bad that it would have allowed an attacker to create bitcoins out of thin air and when the developers discovered this they didn't actually tell anyone <laughs> <laughs> but instead they quickly put together a patch uh, that fixed the bug and then they just told people hey um would you mind installing this patch because yeah we just need like a maintenance update and everyone trusts the, the core development team so there's yeah whatever okay sure we'll um we'll, we'll we'll update our software 
And then when everyone had updated, then we're like, phew, okay, now we can tell you, you know, this was really bad. This could have, this could have really uh, messed things up. Um, and so essentially the community is relying, is trusting um, the core developers to do the right thing and not, for instance, abuse uh, that insider knowledge uh, to, their, to their own benefit. But the Bitcoin community, they've adopted this idea or, or I mean, there is no such thing as the Bitcoin community and there's different <laughs> sort of sub communities and subcultures, but the sort of a dominant idea among uh, a large chunk of sort of Bitcoin um, people today is this idea that um, Bitcoin's rules are now set. We're not going to change any of those rules anymore because as you mentioned there was this debate this blockchain size debate where people were debating which direction should the system take essentially and different interests favored different directions and um, in the end the sort of status quo prevailed let's not change anything that prevailed and so they've got this idea that well it's not governed by humans because we're not going to do make any changes so that's not governing because we're just going to keep things the same and that's not an argument entirely <laughs> without merit but the trouble with that is um uh sometimes you're forced to make changes because the world around you changes either you discover a bug or the systems around you change the interface has changed now you have to update uh, quantum computing comes along. You have to change your cryptographic algorithm. And sometimes those changes, they involve trade-offs. There's multiple alternative ways of solving the problem, and they each have their different um, uh, pros and cons. And which option you choose, that's a political choice because it favors some interests and, and at the right. expense of others. How, how big is the Bitcoin core development team now? Do you know? To be honest, I, I don't know. Uh, I haven't followed because they're less. They're not particularly prominent now because they're they're very much focusing on not doing anything. Oh, interesting. That's the point, right? Um, so I don't know. Like, are there? I don't know. Like something, but something. You know, it's like something around five to ten people. Yeah, it's a small wow. small group. I, I I had understood. I can't remember who I heard that from, but the uh, the, the group had been shrinking for for a while. Yeah, and it was never really bigger than that you know i think probably at its peak it was something like 10 people hmm. uh yeah. now of course there are other developers that may be contributing but these are the people who have right access to the repository right. and fascinating have there been other cases of human discretion affecting the direction of bitcoin well uh yeah um many times uh for instance i mean what what kind of in some ways precipitated the whole block size debate was back in i don't know was this 2011 or something like that very early on uh somebody kind of started spamming the bitcoin network with lots of transactions and uh trouble this you know the trouble with that is if the blocks get filled up with um, or rather, actually, I think the concern at that time was the block the, the size of <laughs> the size of the blockchain started growing a lot, and you know it might have been like a st it's it's many gigabytes, so it might be like a problem storing it for some nodes that want to at that time as well, at least nodes that want to to mine Bitcoin or or uh, function as nodes in the network. Details a little bit hazy, but anyway, something like this happened. Some kind of spamming happened, and Satoshi Nakamoto, who was still the developer at that time, he decided let's put in like a temporary. Well, this debate whether it was intended to be temporary, but I think uh, a temporary, uh, like an upper limit. So he just put like a variable which said there or like constant which said like max block size um, was it one megabyte and just an arbitrary number. Let's just put that so that there's like a an upper limit that one block can take. So that may way the chain can grow uncontrollably. And that was fine for a while, but then when Bitcoin started seeing some actual use and traction, then the number of transactions got high enough that that wasn't enough anymore to record all the transactions that happen in 
uh, a, a one uh, in a 10 minute uh, span of time because one block is appended to the chain approximately every 10 minutes within that that maximum block size set by nakamoto you could only fit about three or four transactions per second which if you compare it with like you know is frequently compared with visa which uh, supposedly processes something like three four thousand transactions a second and has a peak capacity of fifty six thousand uh transactions a second so then three to four transactions a second is really really slow really small capacity right so you couldn't even run you, you probably couldn't even run a big supermarket with, with that number of <laughs> transactions per second let alone a city or a global economy because it's right. supposed to become this global currency right and and so this was an example of a human decision that was just made that had then massive implications uh, later on and so later debate then ensued when, when people started to have to wait for hours to get their transactions confirmed because the, the network was congested um, and debate ensued as to okay should we increase that you know that variable that Nakamoto put in there why don't we put another number you know he just pulled plucked a number out of the air he just put one megabyte why don't we put 20 megabytes and why don't we put eight megabytes uh you know that a debate ensued around this hmm. that was the block size debate i think i've even read that the uh the the limit on the number of bitcoins the the 21 million was also pretty arbitrary by nakamoto yeah yeah and and there was debate as to whether that was the correct number and hmm. uh, how it should go um but then i remember reading i think this was in the bitcoin talk forum or something or 10 years ago somebody was saying um let you know we shouldn't change this aspect of the system because otherwise if people realize that the 21 million bitcoin limit is is likewise arbitrary and, and subject to kind of human decision making then that uh undermines the claim of of this being sort of digital gold and uh right yeah, sort of hard currency. I, I want to ask about a. You had a 2018 paper that looked at the, these issues, like the the instances of of human intervention in Bitcoin. What, what were the discursive strategies that were used to preserve that idea of trustlessness after these human interventions took place? Right, right. So this puzzle. So this was a study I did with uh, Gilly Vidan, who's uh, she's a uh, she's a PhD candidate at Harvard and now in the history of technology. I think she's maybe finishing just now if maybe she even just finished her PhD and um, so the puzzle we were looking at was okay we can see very to, to us it seemed very clear that there was this massive gap between the trustlessness narrative and the trust in code versus the number of people you actually have to trust at various points in the system we've just been talking about the the network itself but then there's all these exchanges that you have to use and all these other institutions that you in practice you must interact with if you're going to uh, participate in the economy and uh, and so there's this like massive gap between promise and reality and yet the show goes on it's it's like like you know we're shouting from the rooftops you know it's not true you know the promise <laughs> it's a false spread the cake is a lie but nobody seems to care they're just like oh we're just gonna keep doing what we've always been doing and so we were like why why is this happening how is this possible and um we found uh, uh four uh, four essentially what we found in this study was that it's because the trustlessness the idea of trustlessness it's not just a technical achievement in fact it's not a technical achievement as we pointed out it, it it's not uh, has not succeeded as a technology. It's a it's a discursive uh, achievement. It's an it's a it's a triumph of a rhetoric. And and there were four uh, discursive strategies. And I think the most important one really is this uh, framing of any gaps between promise and reality as temporary bugs that will be solved by the next version, mm. or if not that, then the version after that, right? Don't worry, the next version will fix this. You say, oh, but you know, this, this is not trustless. I have to trust you. Don't worry, this is because it's just working progress. Next version, or maybe the one after that, we will roll out a feature that oh. gets rid of this. And then if you, if you ask like, well, how do we know this is gonna happen? Well, because this is trustless technology. So, you know, it has to be in the end. 
we know we'll get there. Um, and that that's where it starts to I don't you know, I don't like these comparisons to religion too much, but that's where it starts to uh, kind of become a matter of faith when you say, you know, if you if you just hold true to the, the promise, you know, accept the prophet's uh, teaching uh, and and stay, keep your faith, stay true to the project. In the end, you shall arrive in the promised land. Hmm. And there's going to be difficulties. There's going to be temptations in the way. But if you just hold on to your Bitcoin and preferably buy some more of it, ultimately, eventually we will arrive in the promised land of trustlessness where, where nobody can deprive you of your property anymore. Hmm. Fascinating. And so that was the that was the most important strategy. I mean, then we also one other strategy worth mentioning is this idea of um, kind of assuming that everyone every actor in the system in the network um, conforms to uh, their behavior conforms to a model of a, a rational economic decision maker because if you do that then you can demonstrate you can kind of give a crypto economic proof that the system is that, that, that there's certain guarantees that the miners are not going to undermine the system because it would go against their self-interest to undermine to bite the hand that feeds them, so to say. But the trouble is, of course, the, the rational economic decision maker, that's just a sort of a, an approximation. It's a model that we use in, in science to, 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 to abstract things, but that's not always how people uh, behave. Then you also get all kinds of weird strategic behaviors or irrational behaviors, or, or you get, um, uh, and, and an attacker that has a different payoff function because they're not just operating within the rules of the network. Can you speak to the appeal to technical expertise, which is one of the other strategies? Sure, sure. Um, so one of the strategies is, yeah, it's it's appeal to technical expertise, which, which um, well, it, it is what it says. It says, you know, if you are criticizing this, uh, it's because you don't understand it uh, sufficiently. Uh, listen to these people who are um, who who have the true knowledge and who are the technical experts. And if you ask, well, uh, how do I know who's who's um, who has the true knowledge? Well, you know it because they believe in the system. If you yeah. don't believe in it, that means that you're not sufficiently informed yet. This is what you get on Twitter all the time. If you point to any problems people will say you don't get it you don't understand crypto that's your problem yeah i i wanted to ask about that one because we it's it's so it's everywhere right <laughs> it's so common does the ability to fork blockchain networks restore the trustless or democratic claims of of crypto no that's a really that's a really good question so in open source software in general, there's this idea, like open source has this image that's very kind of egalitarian, democratic, um, um, open, literally, uh, open to participate. Um, it's not a hierarchy. Uh, but then if you look at actual open source project, they're very hierarchical. You know, you've got Linus Torvalds uh, heading, um, Linus Torvalds heading, heading the Linux uh, kernel project and you know he's known to be a very uh, sort of traditional uh, leader in the sense that at least he was that he, he was uh, swearing at his uh, subordinates a lot and keeping tight reins and things and the fact that allows projects like this nevertheless to be sort of conceived of as very egalitarian and democratic is the possibility of a fork that open source software affords which is that you take the software and make a duplicate of it and start developing it in your own direction if you don't agree with the leadership of the project. And um, so in principle, this could be done with crypto projects as well, since usually they are open source software. If you don't agree with the rules of the system, like let's say this block size debate, you don't agree with the, the core uh, group's decision, um, just make your own fork and, and implement a different uh, a direction there, a different set of rules. Or if you don't like the 21 million Bitcoin limit, you know, just make your fork. Yeah, so you can you can just fork it, and that way any in that way um, 
you're not beholden to any any ruler uh even if even if uh, uh trust in humans has not been uh, even if trust in humans has not been eliminated by uh cryptocurrencies trust in any particular human is since you can always just sort of fork it there's two problems with this uh the first problem is that people can't just individually choose which uh, network they want to belong to they have to take the choices of others into account also if they are to continue transacting with those others so this is an example of what, what in social science we call a collective choice problem uh, you and everyone you transact with you they have to choose the, the the system under which you want to transact together because you can't if you just leave the system and go into your own thing then you're alone there and now you can't do any of those things that you were you wanted to use the system to do um, and so humans actually have to choose collectively the rules that we follow and the way to do that is is, is essentially governance institutions it's political institutions it's voting and all, all this sort of stuff how we make collective decisions collective decision making markets uh, which means individual choice are bad at solving uh, collective choice problems precisely because these these external externalities everyone in a network you know it doesn't need to be a blockchain network could could be a a, a giant platform like Amazon, you know, some stuff that I talk about a lot in the Cloud Empires book, everyone could be hating the rules of that system. And yet that system, that platform could still win because each of them individually, if they chose to leave the platform, they would uh, face a massive switching cost because they're leaving behind all those potential connect connections, all those network effects. For the switch from let's say amazon marketplace to an alternative marketplace with uh rules that are pre preferable to the people for that to successfully happen people would actually have to all move together and to be able to coordinate their actions like that they need some kind of um, governance institutions and that's the same thing in, in a crypto in a in a blockchain network um you can't if if you don't like the, the rules of the system, you can't just individually fork it and, and, and leave. You need to coordinate. Um, and coordination needs governance uh, institutions. So that's the first problem why forks, uh, the reason, first reason why forks are not an alternative to, gov uh, to governance institutions. And they can be a complement, but not an alternative. Uh, the second issue with uh, which you don't have with a lot of other open source software, but which you do have with uh, blockchain, is that once it's no longer just some experimental shitcoin, you know, once it's a it's a real production system that's being used to to record property rights in in wealth in stocks or NFTs, non fungible tokens, pictures of apes, or whatever people consider valuable then you what happens if you fork it now you've got two the network splits now you've got two parallel copies of the record right because right because if mm. you know here here in this the original chain i own i own uh, some stock i own some tokenized stock or pictures of apes or something like that and now it's forked and now i own it here and here here i sell it to ban right here i don't so now we've got conflicting records of who owns these things there's only one of that asset there's only one of that company but now there's two owners and the technology provides no answer as to which of those records is the authoritative one humans have to decide that uh, and that's that's a matter for governance that fork in itself the it just leads to chaos wow that, that's like a, that's like a, a a supercharged example of the enforcement problem i guess right yeah. enforcing off-chain stuff 
Absolutely. Yeah, it's crazy to think about. Uh, to, to, to what extent can users of a blockchain network who are not miners in, influence crypto markets? So this is a very complicated and contentious also uh, issue. Uh, formally speaking, if you look at Nakamoto's design and what he wrote in his original Bitcoin white paper, the miners vote with their CPU power. Um, they vote over which set of rules they consider legitimate. They sort of ratify any rule changes proposed by developers. Uh, and that was sort of the end of the story for a long time. But then, long story short, kind of users have found ways of, for instance, pressuring the miners, organizing and, and um, um, threatening to just sort of not go with the miners version. And um, basically, there's politics. Long story short, politics has emerged. And it's very complicated and contentious. There's different interest groups. There's different power blocks. It's all very opaque. Uh, there is all these social media accounts uh, pushing different narratives, and you never know who's funding which one. And right. there's all this crypto media, which is owned by different exchanges and different companies. And there's this whole political economy, is what we would call it. Uh, and um, I, you know, there's there's good things about this political economy as well. It's there, there is so ordinary users can have some power they can participate in those debates but it's not like a, a political economy in which the rules are transparent or well laid out or in any way fair at all it's largely an oligarchy where um, those with uh, those with the means uh, make decisions so long story short like yeah users are not entirely without some means to try to influence things in a crypto economy but they are disempowered in uh formal terms but also informational terms because they the ordinary person just has no idea what is going on in the background and the negotiations between these power blocks hmm. yeah that that's that clears a lot of things up for me because we've had other guests who come from a computer science background and they've said that the miners are the only ones that can control the network. And when we've published those episodes, we've had comments saying like, oh, that's wrong. It's the, it's the nodes, the nodes control the network. And so I, I can- So this is, makes... yeah, this is, yeah, this is the controversy basically. So there was, there was this thing called user activated soft fork in Bitcoin, which is, this is one episode in the block size wars where um because the miners were basically a blocking change and um a, a bunch of non-miner users they uh said we're going to adopt this protocol change anyway and it was extremely unclear what would actually happen because basically the network would splinter at that point you'd have two bitcoins and it would be unclear which one actually wins um and it never kind of reached the end game and the showdown kind of never kind of never game came because to simplify things a lot this user activated soft fork even the possibility of that happening that sort of kicked certain things into action and then a sort of a certain solution or certain outcome was reached and so we don't kind of ultimately know <laughs> what would have happened but yeah. the fact that the mere threat of that was enough to kind of affect things at least a little bit in a certain direction i think shows that users are not without some power but when i say users i mean the people advocating for the user activated software fork they were still powerful people you know with big uh, social media followings they just they were just not the miners huh 
So if you decided, Ben, you don't like the rules of Bitcoin and you own some Bitcoin, you're a user. So, you know, you have you want to have a voice, you want to have make a difference. I, I don't think you're you know, Ben activated soft fork is unfortunately going to have any impact whatsoever on the on the rules or the politics. Right. I need to have my million million Twitter followers or whatever. Well, actually maybe yeah. I just sorry, I'm talking to a sort of social media influencer here because you're like a literal podcaster. So maybe you could have <laughs> I I can't. I can't, but you know, maybe you actually could because if you started really turn your podcast into a in, into a campaign for some particular thing, then maybe you could change them. There you go, Ben. Yeah, our, uh, our, our, our audience wouldn't accept that. They'd be like the, no, the, the nodes rejecting the miners in that case, I think. Right. <laughs> uh, do, do you have a view on who, practically speaking, does have the most control over cryptocurrency networks? Um, the thing is, the cryptocurrency network itself in the case of especially Bitcoin has become irrelevant in many ways, because like I said, it can, you know, they, they, they eventually managed to increase the block, practical block, block size a little bit. So you can fit something like, I don't know, seven transactions per second there now, but still it's nowhere near enough to actually do anything that Bitcoin does today. So the vast majority of people who uh, hold Bitcoin, they don't actually hold the keys to their Bitcoin, right? They uh, deposit their coins in an ex exchange or wallet provider, something like Coinbase and or Binance, and <coughs> and they access their their Bitcoins just like people access online banking. And when they transact, the usually the transactions never touch the blockchain because there just isn't enough space on the blockchain for them. The transactions are cleared in the internal systems of this handful of large corporations. And the Bitcoin network, insofar as it is used, it is used by these large corporations as a sort of interbank settlement network. Um, and also by some, then there are some people who are using it for for smaller transactions as well but but it's so so really the the economic activity denominated in bitcoin has moved away from the blockchain itself which has become a sort of almost like a, all the politics around the blockchain is like a sideshow now what hmm. really matters is what the ceos of a handful really of large corporations that control exchanges and mining and these are billion dollar businesses, multi-billion dollar businesses. Um, they hold most of the power in my assessment. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. I, I, I talked to uh, I talked to somebody else a while ago about this. When we got pushback on the miners controlling the network and they, they gave me the the same answer that it's ultimately the exchanges. And if there was a fork, the exchanges effectively get to dictate which chain is gonna be the, the one everybody migrates to. Exactly. Yeah. Because you know the millions of Binance users, they're not gonna, they're not, they don't follow this thing. You know, right. they don't follow the what's happening in the back end. You know, they're just gonna use whatever Binance says is Bitcoin. If there's two forks, because that's something you can't duplicate. You can duplicate the blockchain, but you can't duplicate the name. There can only be one that's called Bitcoin, right? And uh, in in both, when we've had two. Uh, forks. There was the Bitcoin Bitcoin Cash uh, split, and the exchanges decided after there was some exchanges were a bit they they, they weren't sure which of these uh, 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 chains they were going to give the original ticker symbol BTC. All right, but they eventually settled on the core, not the cash, and this made a huge difference, right? And in the case of Ethereum, so I told you about. And I tell this whole story in, in Cloud Empires in, in a lot uh, a lot more vivid detail. But um, after the DAO hack, uh, when basically Buterin stepped in and said, let's roll things back, um, some people said, like, let's not, because, come on, that sort of um, invalidates the whole idea of immutable code. And they said, 
um, screw you, you know, we're, we're going our own way. We are forking Ethereum. And uh, well, guess which one gets to be called Ethereum, the Buterin's new version, because he changed the rules, right? So he actually created a new version that's sort of not the original one. And then these other people, they, they actually kept the old version, the unchanged one. So in terms of sort of continuity, I think it would have been more accurate to describe these dissidents version as Ethereum. And then the, the, the Buterin version should have been called like um, uh, Ethereum, uh, managed Ethereum or something like that. See what I mean? Yeah. Right? But that's not what happened because there is an Ethereum foundation which owns the trademark to Ethereum. And so ultimately they could just use the force of law to say, no, we are called Ethereum. You go and pick yourselves a new name. And I don't believe in this case it came went that far to the lawyer level. Uh, the dissidents uh, named their fork Ethereum Classic and went their own way. Crazy. And that's a, a trademark that's a very, that exists. Uh, that's a marginal yeah ethereum is a trademark owned by the ethereum foundation and the foundation is is controlled by this bunch of people including uh, vitalik buterin and so you don't get to call things they get to decide what is called ethereum wow. based on the off-chain legal system though that's right <laughs> <laughs> to put a fine point on it yes uh, so we talked earlier about the clarotarian what aspect of athenian democracy did nakamoto fail replicate right so the claritarian was a way of decentralizing government administration and administration means the application and enforcement of rules but the other side of the athenian democratic coin so to say is legislation the making of those rules um, and the Athenians had figured out systems for decentralizing both, right? So they had systems for the claritarian was for decentralizing the actual application and enforcement of those rules. And then they had a different set of institutions for decentralizing the making of those rules. They had essentially, they had public assemblies um, where people would come together and, 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 and uh, well, vote on things and, and shout a lot in various different things happened um, and Nakamoto he only duplicated the decentralization of administration part he built a claritarian um, out of code but he didn't build anything comparable to the decentralization of legislation the rulemaking that part was left just not it's just a gap there is no nothing for it um people developers who came later uh, uh andresen uh gavin andresen he put in place um a software development process which you could say is in some ways almost like the constitution in the sense that but in a very very loose sense in the sense that it it defined a process through which <laughs> the, ch rule, the rules could be changed. It was a very, um, very kind of abstract, very brief document. Uh, but be beyond that, there's, and, and it's a very simple thing. It just says, okay, people can propose things. And then, you know, if we, the core developers think it makes sense, we'll implement the change after there's been some debate about it. Um, but that's it. So there's no formal institutions. There's no uh, accepted decision making procedure that everyone considers legitimate and uh, binding on themselves. And as a result, uh, when a conflict like the block size debate erupts, there's no way of resolving it peacefully because, uh, like I said, there is no way of ma making a collective decision that everyone mm -hmm. agrees. They'll just say, no, you, you're wrong and I, we don't accept your position. Hmm. Can you talk about the blockchain paradox, which is, I think, related to what you were just saying? So, yeah, I think it's now kind of known as the governance uh, paradox. So I gave this talk in the Alan Turing Institute in 2016, where I, uh, where I came up with this. 
basically the idea is like okay once you so first of all you do, you still have to solve this problem of governance somehow or governance i use the term governance here to mean uh, essentially the legis what i just described as legislation the making of those rules who gets to make them and are the makers accountable to the people or not um, so if we accept that we haven't solved that problem, that we haven't solved the ancient problem of political science, we haven't actually built a trustless system, there's still humans involved. Yeah. Uh, okay, so now assume you then manage, you do then build a nice governance system. You like uh, agree that, well, we should have voting somehow, like, and you agree who is eligible to vote and, um, and they they can elect a board of governors or something or yeah, there's some kind of a procedure for that somehow um great so now you can govern uh, your blockchain in a way that <coughs> makes sure that it's accountable um, to the people question what do you need blockchain technology for anymore at that point why not just have your system run on an ordinary server and have that governance system govern that server because you've just agreed that now you have a governance system that holds things accountable to the people. Why, why do you need this complex technology for at that point? Yeah. Maybe like, let's say you're in a zero trust environment, like you're, you can't trust the administrators, the server administrators. You're afraid the server administrators are not going to implement the, the rules or something like that. You know, maybe some cryptographic uh, guarantees might help there. But even even in a blockchain system, we can't cryptographically compel the core developers to do exactly what they promise to do or what they're asked to do or what community decides them to do. And this is something that the on-chain governance systems continuously run into, right? So we now, because people did start taking the governance problem seriously outside Bitcoin, right? So people came up with these all these projects where somehow people on the on they get governance tokens and then they can vote on proposals but sometimes you find that okay well now the community vote on a proposal and developers just say oh, i can't be bothered you know and uh, oh, it can't be done or you know and maybe they it really can't be done but there's no cryptographic on-chain way to actually compel the developers to do do that and so blockchain doesn't actually solve that part either so the paradox is you the blockchain governance paradox is once you solve the governance problem of blockchain what do you need blockchain for anymore that's that's the paradox it's a provocation uh, and i i get email all the time telling me they they solved the paradox and nobody has so far in my opinion that's so interesting you, you talked earlier about how you you need governance whether you like it or not because the world changes even if you don't want to change the world changes around you yeah you can get away for a while with not changing things, you know, just hands off, let it just run its, you know, continue in the same direction. But eventually it's going to, if it just continues the same, it's going to hit a wall eventually, unless you correct course, because there's things in the real world that get in the way. Yeah. And then if you have to decide, are we going to go around this objective this way or that way? And that's a political decision. Wow. So on, on that basis, do you think technology changes the fundamental social and economic forces that shape how societies are organized so no that's in <clears> some <throat> ways that's that's cloud empire's kind of main takeaway that actually with all this technology we've just managed to after and after 20 years of moving fast and breaking things we've just managed to essentially re-implement the same social order that we already had instead instead of legal code and some some of it is program code and instead of government administrators some of it is miners and and, and customer support people in, in in corporations um but the basic form of it which is a formal authority uh that runs a bureaucracy that enforces rules uh to maintain social order at scale and make it possible for people to trade with uh people they don't know on a, on a massive scale, the fundamentals of that haven't changed. What has changed though, is the fact that now th they're not territorial nation states. 
that are that are doing this enforcement are the formal institutions that they are uh, in a lot of cases they are large technology companies uh, and that is a, a very major change so in 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 in, in many ways um, or they are in the case of blockchain systems it's a bit hard to tell who who is actually in charge right so that's that's kind of one, one of my conclusions in cloud empires is that nakamoto failed to eliminate uh trust and authorities uh from the system but he managed to obscure uh, who the authorities are and who we are actually trusting hmm. like most people just don't even hmm. know anymore wow. and i call that um cryptocracy right because in greek crypto means hidden uh crassy is is a power uh, rule uh so we moved from you know he wanted to avoid autocracy and he didn't want to go for democracy so he ended up creating a cryptocracy we just don't know who is in charge anymore that's so good indeed uh, so has blockchain supplanted the need for nation states? Uh, not blockchain, but if if you take um, blockchain and mainly these large corporations then that actually run most of the crypto economy, all of that together, uh, they perform some of the core functions of uh, uh, nation states today in terms of protecting property rights and right. certain forms of property. But the trouble is um, most of the blockchain systems, they are not really used for trade and kind of productive economic activity. They are used for speculation or get rich schemes and and for for investment schemes in which no actual value is created it's just redistributed people are hoping people are buying tokens in the hopes of being able to later offload them to someone for an even higher price uh, there is no dividends being uh, paid there were <laughs> there were some so-called staking rewards being paid but those were essentially based on a sort of ponzi type uh, logic which has now become apparent to hopefully even to the investors in those schemes um, there are other cloud empires um, like the Amazon empire, which is in which the rulers are easier to discern. It's not a cryptocracy, it's an autocracy with a CEO on top. Um, and their uh, systems are uh, used for productive activities like uh, trade. Hmm. So what do you think ultimately cryptocurrencies have accomplished since their, I guess, inception as at least an idea in 2008? Well, I think they've, they've managed to accomplish this uh, obfuscation of power. So instead of making power accountable, they've managed to obfuscate who actually has it. And in that sense, maybe make power even less uh, accountable and creating the cryptocracy instead of returning democracy to finance. Um, <laughs> they've also managed, they've also succeeded to uh, redistribute a lot of actual money from uh, a bunch of late uh, comers to a bunch of uh, early movers. So they've had this uh, centralizing effect of centralizing actual currency to from a large number of people to a slightly smaller number of people. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think it's also fair to say that they've uh, opened up what we sometimes call so people's sociological imaginaries, right? People are imagining different ways, radically different ways of uh, organizing society. And even if not all of those visions are uh, ever realizable, Cloud Empires is a story of many such high visions uh, running into fundamental social and economic forces that in fact constrain what sorts of uh, futures are possible uh, for us humans. Even, so even if those visions can't all be realized, I think dreaming and thinking big is still valuable. I don't think as humanity we've reached 
the uh, sort of apex of of uh, evolution <laughs> in, in terms of social organization that this system based on carving up uh, the face of uh, the surface of our planet into these mutually exclusive zones and then saying you know you have control over this one you have control over that one I don't think that's the necessarily the end of our of our kind of uh, experiments to to figure out how we govern ourselves uh, as a species um, and we know it's a the limits of that system are showing right we have global problems like climate change that uh face collective action problems uh in a world divided up into mutually exclusive chunks uh, and once again hot war has returned in massive scale into europe um, and war is something wedged between nation states unreal that that's in our research on this topic i think that's generally been my takeaway too that it, it's making people rethink what is possible from the perspective of organization and economics but it's it's not necessarily actually accomplishing anything new yeah i think that's 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 accurate but um another outcome might be that people appreciate our um current uh, forms of organization more they realize like oh actually uh, you know we, we we thought we could just circumvent government like just obsolete government so easily um, turns out we can't. Maybe we ought to focus our energies on making our government better and more accountable. Yeah, awesome. All right, Billy, that was our last question. This has been a fantastic conversation. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much. I, 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 I think this was a really exciting conversation. Uh, you guys are really thinking about big things. And uh, I, I do have to say, I am slightly surprised we managed to cover so much ground. <laughs> uh, in this time. Great to meet but you, Billy, and thanks current, for your time. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Have a nice weekend. Thank you. Thank you.